I'll be talking about the modeling approach that we've been using. We've been using a, a mechanistic uh, population model um, and how we parameterize this model to work with hydro peaking. And then I'll go over our simulations for the current hydro peaking regime in Nina uh, or in the Nidelva before I go on to talk about how we're going to be developing the model because we'll need to make some improvements to the model so that it uh, can be adapted for uh, multi hydro peaking events for, throughout uh, a single day. So if I talk about the modeling approach uh, first, um, we've been using a, a mechanistic model to examine constraints on salmon populations uh, for many different phenomena such as uh, climate change effects or changes in uh, river regulation regime. Uh, we've started doing this also for uh, hydro peaking, but we've been doing a fairly crude modeling of how hydro peaking impacts on uh, salmon populations. So we need to make uh, further refinements to the model. The model we're using is an individual based population model. So here we model uh, individual fish as uh, agents within the model and we examine how they move throughout their life uh, cycle. So it begins with eggs, then you get swim up to fry. Uh, these become juvenile par. Uh, when they smoltify, they go out to sea and they return and come back and deposit eggs again. And at all these stages, they're influenced by characteristics of the environment, such as the temperature regime or the discharge regime. And these can be affected by external phenomena, such as hydro peaking. And we use um, this mechanistic approach because what occurs at one part of a salmon's life, the effect of this will be influenced by what occurs at another part of a salmon's life. So for instance, if hydro peaking causes a high mortality in juveniles in a river population, that would re result in a reduction in population abundance. But this reduction in population abundance will cause a whole cascade of other effects that might cause decreases in subsequent mortality. So it's important to understand how um, the effects of one process such as hydro peaking um, propagate through the life cycle of, of the salmon when you're determining the aggregate effects. So we have a model that's able to model these effects within a salmon population. Um, the problem with this is that it's quite um, uh, um, inform information based, that it requires a lot of uh, information on what's going on in the environment and it can be difficult to parameterize the, the model. So we often have to make some assumptions and we often have to simplify the processes that we're actually wanting to model based on the data available. So if, I, if I'm talking about the model we've developed, it has advantages over other uh, population models in that we are able to model uh, salmon populations over the long term. A lot of individual based models will only model a salmon population within a year or within an even shorter period of time, we can model the entire life cycle so we can look at uh, issues such as uh, whether there's going to be long term stability in the population. We can look at feedback mechanisms within the population, which can be very important. And we've made the model spatially explicit. So by this, I mean that we have a, a water course and we compartmentalize it into a series of cells and we model processes occurring in each cell. Uh, so the cells are spatially integrated, which is a potential problem for this. So we don't know where the salmon is right now within the cell. 
but we can get characteristics from the cell such as the abundance of salmon, uh, the age structure, the length structure, the proportion that are dying from certain issue, issues. But if you look at this, it's quite a simplified approach if you want to do a proper hydro peaking analysis because we really want to be doing this on a, on a, on a finer scale than this uh, longitudinal cell-based approach that we've been previously using. So that comes on to the current limitations. The, the model actually has a coarse spatial resolution with respect to the processes that we're wanting to model. And we also have quite a coarse temporal resolution. The, the resolution's only uh, a one week resolution. And obviously, if we're looking at short term hydro peaking effects, we have to find a way to temporally integrate the resultant effect of multiple hydro peaking effects so that they can be incorporated into this core spatial resolution. So some work has to be done outside the framework of this individual based model. We need to do further modeling outside that, produce some results which can be integrated into this model. So the developments we've been making with regard to Hydroflex are that we have been working on how to aggregate, aggregate effects of multiple stranding events so that it fits with the time step of the model. And we've been trying to get around this limitation in the model that it's got a, a spatially integrated cell. We've been working to see if we can find a way to look at the spatial distribution of fishes within each cell so we can compare these spatial distributions within the cell with the spatial distribution in changes in the habitat such as how much of the habitat is dewatered so we're running it for the need elva uh for the downstream part, the, the part downstream of uh, the lowermost hydropower station, uh, Lerfoss. And, um, and this is the uh, salmon supporting area. So it's about 10 kilometers long. Um, it's quite a, a well studied river in comparison to many in, in Norway. Uh, there's good information on the physical characteristics of the habitat possibly with the exception of substrate. We do know how substrate, uh, bed substrate changes, but it's not mapped in detail along the river. Um, the salmon population, we do have information on that. There's more information on the population in this river than in most, but we only have point samples. So for instance, we only have uh, about 10 locations within the river where salmon have been, uh, salmon abundances have been estimated in uh, with any robustness. So it's difficult to get a first idea of how the salmon spatial distribution in, exists within this river without doing some further in, in interpolation. So we've been doing this as a starting point to run the model, we need to know the spatial distribution of the salmon juveniles. And as a first approach, we've been using, basing this on spawning locations and habitat suitability. Then we need to know what is the effect of uh, down ramping during hydro peaking on the spatial distribution of habitat that will support salmon. So, We've been looking at this. We need to know the hydrodynamic regime in the river, how often it hydro peaks. And we need to have um, some estimate of how we can bring all these phenomena together into a stranding mortality. And this involves creating um, uh, a mechanistic function where we can say there's a certain probability of this fish dying if it's in this location. So going on for the spatial distribution of salmon. Estimating this, we, we begin by looking at spawning locations and spawning locations have been surveyed in this river. The survey data are fairly old. They're about 10 years old, but we don't think there'll have been a massive difference in spawning locations. 
So in this image, you can see the, the, the green um, circles. These are individual spawning sites that have been surveyed on the ground. Um, uh, this was surveyed by NTNU. Um, and they're in a mixture of, of habitats. So this is where we, we start out with the salmon population. This is where in our model, um, the population begins. And then we want to redistribution, redistribute this population throughout the river on the basis of the uh, optimal habitat for salmon to exist in. The problem with this river is that there haven't been enough measurements of the habitat across the river for us to be able to redistribute the salmon juveniles across the river based on the habitat. Um, so we're having to use a, a simple uh, preference curve system. So throughout the literature, when people study fish locations in a river relevant re relative to environmental properties such as velocity, depth, or substrate size, they can often uh, develop curves showing the optimal habitat. So for instance, in salmon juveniles, you'll find optimal habitat at about 40 meters per second at a depth of about 50 uh, centimeters. Um, so there's some criticism of this approach It's uh, and about how um, globally it can be applied, but as a first step, we use this approach. We assume that salmon will be gravitating towards certain areas with low velocities and low depths. And if we can predict these habitat characteristics throughout the river, we can assign the areas that the salmon will move to. So for this, we've been using uh, data from Anna Huaref on uh, Knut Alfredson at NTNU, where they've used HECRAS to predict uh, the hydraulics throughout the river. Um, so this is just showing velocity and depth. We have hydraulics predicted across the river from uh, the outlet at Leafoss and to uh, the river mouth. If we know these velocities and these depths, and we have a method by which we know which velocities and which depths the salmon gravitate to, we can then predict the salmon initial spatial distribution. So this uh, image here is showing a prediction of the spatial distribution of salmon juveniles uh, around uh, a part near to the upstream part of the watercourse. So if it's in dark blue, there's no salmon. When it gets to yellow, you get a high number of juveniles. And this prediction's consistent with what um, we would expect to find and what has been observed from occasional point sampling. Um, so in this case, for instance, you don't find large numbers of juveniles on the outside uh, shore of a meandering river because the water's too deep and too fast flowing there. You're more likely to find um, juveniles in this sheltered habitat on the uh, inner edge of an island. So we think we've got a fairly good estimate of the juvenile distribution. What we need to do from this is to see the um, how much this overlaps with areas that are stranded. So using um, Anna and Knut's data, we can get an estimate of the dewatered areas. So they ran the hydraulic model with um, discharges of 15, 35, 85, and uh, I think 115 cubic meters per second. And this is showing the dewatered area. The image on the, on the right is showing the dewatered area where when the discharge is reduced to 35 meters per second, which is what we're currently considering to be the discharge during the down ramping event. 
So we want to look at the overlap between the distribution of juveniles and the distribution of the dewatered area to work out our stranding within each cell. And from there, we can go on to estimate the mortality. So working out the mortality, um, if you get rapid down ramping and you get dewatering, it's possible that a fish can survive even if it's in a dewatered location. So we need to work out this uh, survival rate. And for this, we're using field studies done in the Nidelva. Uh, the main example is salt vape, but there are, uh, there's some other work on this too, where they enclosed areas and uh, netted off areas of the river, put fish in there, waited until the water level fell, waited until it, until it came up a bit and then worked out the survival rate within each netted location. So you can get an indication of the mortality if a fish is within a stranded area. And his, uh, our summary of the work of salt fight and some other Authors, so we can say, for example, that um, a zero plus power are the youngest uh, juveniles in the first year. We can say, for instance, that if there's a single stranding event, a pars in a dewatered part of the location in summer, there's a 10% probability of it dying. So we can bring these all together. We can bring in the preferred area that we've predicted from our modeling, where you find the salmon the dewatered area during the down ramping, our estimates of standing mortality probability from the uh, field observations in, in the enclosed nets to get a total stranding. Um, with regard to Hydroflex, we wanted to further improve on the model. Um, there's the issue that if a, a part of the river gets dewatered, it's not inevitable that fish will stay in there. So in this image, uh, the blue areas are those, all areas that are colored in are areas that are dewatered during a down ramping event. The blue areas are those that had, are, however, in close proximity to an area of the river that still has water within it during down ramping. And the issue is that salmon can swim. So if you get down ramping, if they're close to an area that's near to uh, an area with water flowing through it, and a, a salmon can swim from a dry area to fr from a drying area to an area that can still support it. Uh, the opposite, however, might be um, if uh, a fish is if a, if a salmon is in a location that's a long distance from the wetted part of the channel on down ramping, it may be too far for it to swim. So we also need to take into account salmon behavior with regard to dewatering. So we further advance the model where we can look at the movement ability as well. We can say, how far can the salmon move? If it can move five if meters, then we can say it's in a dewatered area, but it's able to move five meters to the wetted channel nearby. But if it can only move five meters and it's further away from the wetted channel, then we can apply the stranding mortality to this. So um, we found that dewatering of um, juvenile fish, the fry and the par within the river can have an effect. We were also interested in how much dewatering of spawning locations could affect the habitat. So if you have salmon spawning in October, November, a swim up occurring in April, for instance, and there's dewatering of the spawning site, that could lead to uh, desiccation of eggs and uh, the inability for salmon to swim up because the eggs have died. Um, we looked at this for the Nidelva and there isn't a very big overlap between where the spawning locations are and where the dewatered locations are. So if 
for our work, we include this in the model also, but for our work, it really is this uh, previously mentioned issue of stranding mortality of juveniles that really affects what's going on in the population. So the current simulations we've been running it for um, present day uh, discharge patterns. So we uh, received uh, this date, these data which show that um, stranding events are typically occurring once a day throughout the year. So it's not a very high level of stranding. <clears throat> Running our model with these data, we can get a simulation of the salmon population. And what we really want to do is to be able to see how much our population parameters that are simulated concur with those that, are, that have been observed. And if there is a good concurrence, we can say that under this fairly light hydro peaking regime, our model runs, and we, it's a reasonable to go on to model, to use this modeling. We've got a good enough um, understanding of what's going on to use this model, therefore to model under a greater hydro peaking regime. So we've got a fairly good simulation of the salmon population in terms of age composition, uh, body characteristics such as body mass, body length, um, salmon production, the number of smolt going out to sea from our model is similar to that observed. So we're fairly confident we've got a good prediction. At the moment, we've been using this modeling approach to um, try to investigate how hydro peaking is influencing certain aspects of the population. This is with a few to publishing the results. So for instance, we've been looking at how uh, mortality affects the population. So here's showing uh, uh, how uh, mortality has a differential effect on the population according to how old the fish is. And this is the type of thing that you can only investigate using mechanistic modeling. Uh, if we were to just do effects of mortality on single stranding events using empirical in situ measurements within the river, we would only be able to determine the effect of individual stranding events. Here we find greater mortality in older groups because they've been affected by so many more stranding events than younger age groups. And this can only be found reasonably using uh, this type of agent-based modeling. And we've also been investigating uh, one of the uncertainties, how the fish response to stranding affects the population characteristics. So, we do know that fish can swim and they can swim away from uh, dewatered, dewatering areas during down ramping, but there's some uh, inconsistency in the, in the literature as to how far they can swim. So we can say here, for instance, that if fish have a high swimming ability, there won't be much stranding model, mortality and you'll get a high production from the river if fish have a limited ability to swim, you'll get much more stranding mortality and a much lower smolt production. So we're working on this as, as a paper, understanding the interaction between the habitat characteristics with regard to habitat availability, with regard to which areas are stranding and with regards to what behaviors the fish are actually able to show. Future activities, we want to do modeling where we have multiple hydro peaking events per week, uh, per day, uh, 30 start stops. And this, uh, we're gonna have to do some development of the model to be able to do this. Um, because at the moment we're just modeling, a, we've only been modeling with a low hydro peaking regime, just one hydro peaking regime per day. And we can be fairly sure that 
the effects of one hydropeaking regime, one hydropeaking event are independent of the effects of a hydropeaking event on previous days, that there's been one hydropeaking event, it causes some mortality, but after that, the uh, juveniles can recover and go to their favored areas. And then there's a, a subsequent hydropeaking event the day later. The problem with this approach, which uh, I'm showing here where we use these mortalities, is that these mortalities are probably going to be too high to apply them to individual hydropeaking events if we have multiple hydropeaking events throughout the day. If we have 30 hydropeaking events within one day, these mortalities are, are far too high. Um, and I can show it here. So we've got a single cell. We assume that 50% of, of, of the individuals within the cell will be in a stranding zone. We're running the model, say, for, for seven hydropeaking events. Assume a, a stranding probability of 10% and you'll get a gradual decline because after each hydropeaking event, the hydropeaking event occurs, fish die, then the fish recover, they redistribute across the cell. Then another hydropeaking event occurs, a certain proportion die, and, and so on. If we are doing many successive hydropeaking events, this will cause population extirpation. So here's an example of 70 hydropeaking events. So it could be a week's worth of hydropeaking at a high hydropeaking regime. Running with a, a stranding mortality per event of 10% is going to destroy the population and we wouldn't ex expect this to happen. We expect that if you have a very high rate, rate of hydropeaking, that there will be behavioral changes in the salmon such that they adapt to the hydropeaking regime and such that the stranding mortality from an individual hydropeaking event is reduced. That is that the salmon redistribute towards certain areas within the river that are less affected by hydropeaking. So this is the issue that we're dealing with at the moment, and this is what we're currently starting to model. Rather than the issue that we have that a hydropeaking event leads to a certain number of individuals dying, we are now assuming that with a hydropeaking event, there will be a certain number of individuals that remain in deep water such that there will be a reduction in stranding mortality in successive hydropeaking events. So we are going to change our stranding mortality model to take this into account. And the issue is how to parameterize this. Um, a big problem with all um, field data is that there's all uh, biological data with regards to rivers is that there's often a lack of available data in comparison to what you'd get, for instance, with uh, looking at abiotic properties through hydraulic modeling. So currently we're planning on using a simulation based approach, at least to examine the sensitivity. And I think um, the idea of using this approach we could use a, a mechanistic individual based model approach, but I think it would be a good idea to simplify this and do this within a different modeling environment than the current model that we're using. So we're using a model called IB Salmon, but to actually work out how to parameterize IB Salmon, it's probably going to be easier and a, a lot quicker to produce a small model in say uh, there's a good package called net logo for instance that allows easy building of uh, this type of um, deterministic model so we can get that model to get some indication of how salmon will redistribute themselves in multiple hydro peaking events and then from that we can get a model function that we can 
include in, in IB salmon and get a, a more realistic estimate of what happens after multiple hydro peaking. So to summarize, um, we've got the model calibrated to simulate current conditions in the need of, uh, and we're working on a manuscript that will look at the interaction between how the fish are spatially distributed, how the characteristics of the dewatered areas are spatially distributed, particularly with regard to how wide dewatered areas are and how uh, the ability of fish um, to swim can all influence the total stranding effects of hydro peaking. We're about to begin with future scenarios. Uh, so we, we expect to get um, the new hydro peaking regimes uh, soon, but we need to do further model development with regards to the stranding model so that it's more applicable to future hydro peaking regimes where we can expect behavioral changes and changes in spatial distributions as a result of that high intensity of down ramping. So with that, if there's anything, any questions maybe? Yes, uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, very nice presentation, uh, indeed. And uh, yes, there are already several questions on the chat, and I think we start there uh, this time. So first question is from Heini Ovenin. Ovenin. <laughs> Sorry uh, for the pronunciation. <laughs> Difficult to speak here. Uh, Heini, uh, would you like to ask your question? Otherwise I can read it. So, so the question is, uh, in Richard, in your experience, which are the most important data needs or gaps in, in, uh, in current availability information, which would help improving the model results, accuracy and reduce? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's. Yeah, that's a really good um, a question. Um, in regards to if if we if we were looking at rare stranding events, so as, when they do down ramping every day or a, a few times a week, it's information on fish movements is well two things: fish movements. So how far can a fish move in response to a, a single stranding event? And any further information on fish mortality? We do have information on fish mortality, but it's only a, a few studies and there's some inconsistency between the studies. Uh, in regards to um, multiple down ramping events, so multiple start stops per day uh, it's how it's the long-term effects of this so if you have for instance 10 stranding events within a day how to what extent does that cause fish to redistribute so that they stay in deeper parts of the water column and these deeper parts of the water column might be suboptimal in terms of um, the perfect conditions for a fish but they're optimal when there's 10 stranding events occurring today. So it's how do fish redistribute within the water column? Um, there are a few other issues, uh, but it's maybe not so important, but there are other issues about the effects of hydro peaking other than direct stranding. So for instance, how is hydro peaking we, we know that increased turbidity in the water causes damage to fish for, through the small particles getting into the fish gills. But we don't, it's not being quantified in detail how this is going to affect mortality of, of fish. So, and how big an issue th this would be in, in increased standing. So it's mainly on the, on the fish movements 
fish mortality and changes in behavior if you have multiple stranding events. Right. Good. There's also an, an, a follow-up question, which actually can be, be answered in, in relation to, to Hydroflex, and that is what would be required to apply the model in other rivers, because we will not use this kind of modeling in Umeälv. Instead, there will be a yeah, discussion together with Swedish Agricultural University uh, about the results of the hydraulic modeling. But yeah. is it possible at all to... to uh, or then you need more data, right? Yeah, it it, it is. Um, the data requirements are, are not that difficult to get in terms of um, in terms of physical requirement in terms of the the abiotic characteristics of the model. So we've done it for quite a, quite a few rivers, and some rivers we've got good data so that the model is quite based in reality and in some rivers there's been a fair bit of uh, sort of fudging about what we think are the the characteristics but we have to say that we don't we're not a hundred percent sure so we're interpolating or a bit of guesswork the main characteristics is that you need information on the channel profile um, you need information on um, aspects of the habitat that will impact upon where you find salmon. And depending on the river, you can use different aspects. So you could base this on velocity and depth, but you could also base it on um, substrate size. If you have those data, you might be able to make it based on meso scale habitat surveys that can be done from the bank so you can use all these methods but the model results are only really going to be as good as how well you've parametrized it and the other issue is getting a biological data it can be a lot of rivers don't have good information on the salmon population so you not necessarily sure whether your model's producing the right number of smolts, for instance, because there aren't just the data might not exist on smolt production. Yeah. But it is a transferable model. Right. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, Tina Hedlund, you also have a couple of questions. Would you like to yeah. take? Yeah. Uh, I can start with the last one that connects to Heine's questions. Do you know anything about how fast the fish will return when it up ramps again and increase the flow? <clears throat> because that would be very important if you have several events per day. Yeah, yeah. Um, Is there any inf I, information about that at all? I don't. Um, I... I yeah, this is the problem. The literature tends to be really sparse on this area, and I've been looking a lot at literature on literature on fish movements, short scale fish movements, in in response to um, rapid changes in water, and it's not good for that. So, actual parameterization of this is going to be difficult. Getting something that's based in reality will be difficult. Uh, I think um, in, return, in regards to the model, and we're just going to have to do it for a range of possible fish movements that are biologically realistic and just say that there's uncertainty in this. But the actual existing data is, is really limited in this area. Because if they don't return uh, until yeah. the next down ramping, yeah, you you won't get the mortality once again because they are yeah not yeah yeah yeah, and I I think um, if if we get in the case where we've got multiple down ramping events in in a day, you know, ten or ten to thirty, that you you, you must be getting structural changes in in the distribution of of, of the fish. They're going to stay in deep deeper water. And that connects to another question. Uh, since they are able to swim, they are, after all, fish. Uh, how far they go 
it should not only be connected to the habitat, uh, but, but predation, competition, and so on in, in the area. Because, yeah. as you said, it, it, the habitat might be sub, suboptimal uh, when yeah. going deeper, but you have other more biological factors as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, another issue that we have to think about. Um, we, we, we have included um, an, an additional source of uh, mortality within the model. It's a density dependent model. So there's density dependent mortality in the model that's also that uh, shows really a, a response to you can only get so many fish in an area. And if you get too many in an area, they start antagonistic interactions. Uh, but this hasn't yet been included. It, we, we've only just started uh, to consider these uh, short-term movements in regards to stranding. So this hasn't been included in the model in its current form. And maybe that's something we, sh we should actually really think about. And, and um, the density is not only connected to, when you said it recently, it sounds like you're talking about the same size of fish, but small fish, yeah. finger, uh, yearlings would not coexist with bigger yeah. fish. Yeah, true. yeah, so. they're not going to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, another thing that we really need to doing the model uh, we've got the options for looking at separate size effects within the model but we typically uh, well we didn't have enough information to parameterize it well so we've got a range of ages so therefore the big range in sizes in the model yeah. so and one yes. last question have you modeled any differences for summer or winter time since during winter, fish is more stationary. Uh, and yeah. If they are forced to move. They they will get more stressed. During yeah. Winter than, yeah. Than summertime. Is it any difference in the in the model? Uh, the within the model, uh, we we have a different mortality within the model for summer and winter, and for day and for night. But that's based on um, field measurements within uh, netted pens. <clears throat> so we can assume within these netted pens that there's no, no big movements. Um, so we've got a mortality that varies according to diurnal period or season, but isn't a mortality associated with movement. And now that we're including movement in the model, yeah, that's something that we, that's a, a good point. It's something that really should be included. And I think currently I'm, I'm really strongly um, in favor of using say NetLogo, which is a really good modeling package for doing, for analyzing uh, movements of, well, for instance, you could use it for, um, it's a, um, a mechanistic modeling, an agent-based mechanistic modeling package that really lends itself to looking at fish movements. And that would be the best type of package to write something where we can incorporate seasonal effects in movements that would affect subsequent stranding mortality. So we can get a properly, we can get a function that at least we've done a full sensitivity analysis of what, what's going on for inclusion in the IB salmon model. Okay, so thank you, Richard. Shall we take the final question on, on the chat and then we have to move forward. That is from UH Hallenåker uh, or Aker. Uh, can, would you like you to take the question? Uh, yes, if you can hear me. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, uh, thanks for a very nice presentation, both of you. Um, one issue that was not really highlighted when we did many of the experiments on stranding in the Stone Age <laughs> was the issue of predation. And I've heard from, for instance, from people in Sveco, which have done experiments on uh, fine tuning these bypass valves that have been uh, installed in several small scale hydropower plants in Norway. 
uh, where they have been watching dewatering episodes. They have seen that minks and otters have been have had really good days to to uh, to yeah to 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 catch fish, juveniles downstream honeypot plants. So and and even in when we had experiment in in Nidelva when we had this uh, radio tagged uh, uh, par, we saw that some even were, were caught by otters. So could it be that um, predation could be an a sort of a joker in your population modeling, an additional stressor for the for the salmon populations? Yeah, I'm sure it'll be an issue. Uh, but uh, how to the problem with our modeling is we're trying to base it as much as as what we can find within. Uh, the literature to, for the calibration of our, our modeling and getting predation. We've, I've not come across anything which shows how predation is going to be an issue, but I'm, I'm sure it will be. Even if, um, if you look at during a time when there are seagulls around, when parts of the Nidalva get dewatered, uh, the dewatered area can be, become covered in, in birds. So if you have a small fry or a zero plus par, I'm, I'm sure predation is going to be a big issue. Well, but it's it's parameterizing the model because uh, we don't have the information about how, how big an issue it is. Okay, thank you, uh, Richard, and for the very nice questions. Uh, so now we, we come to the last uh, 